Uh, we, we do have mics up here. Okay, great, I just wanted to make sure. Um, before we go into the Q&A, I don't know if many of you are aware, but today is actually I can't, um, National Human Trafficking Awareness Day, January 11th. And um, in New York, we've had our share, and we'll have more questions that's going to come um, your way. Um, but right now, I just want to talk to you just for two minutes about the need, particularly as people of faith, that we really mobilize to do more for trafficking victims. And I know you've heard our story where we almost lost our first grader, 22 year old almost lost, and with the intervention of you know some that are up here, we were able to get her back. But it's happening everywhere. It's not a third world country issue. It's an issue that's affecting each and every one of us. It's in our own backyard. And I really want to put out a strong appeal to please, 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 really start looking at ways we can work together as people of faith in order to combat these atrocities. And what I do want to announce here today that I'm very ecstatic about, I chair the New York City Faith Race Coalition Against Human Trafficking and Domestic Violence. And today we launched an official, not on my watch, Safe Haven Network. And it's a faith-based alliance taking the lead to eliminate human trafficking and domestic violence, where we now have hundreds on board that have said yes to the call of combating these atrocities. And I just wanted to share that information. I want you to take time to just follow us at NOMW Safe Haven, which is not on my watch, Safe Haven, at NOMW Safe Haven. Start following us as of today. Because today, in honor of the day, we are literally in the streets right now, um, pretty much all day. I can't get it to move. I don't know if I'm pointing it to the right direction. Richard, I can't get it to move. <laughs> Richard, you can, okay, there we go. So today we launch Campaign Beautiful, and that's going to be our theme throughout the year so that people can know the beauty that's within them. And so today throughout the city, I may have to have Rich come up here and do this, a <laughs> challenge. We have tw over 20 awareness events taking place um, in January. Today we have over 15 taking place because we are a growing faith-led network and the first of its kind in the city. And we're looking at partnering, and we are, have already been partnering with service providers and agencies and more. And we want you as faith leaders to join the network, participate in these events that are going on. It's all about awareness. We're in shelters doing glam days. We're having panel discussions. We're having movie nights. Tonight is a movie night right here in my house of worship called Soul. It's a very important day to acknowledge, but beyond the day, we need to band together in order to see the decrease in the numbers of sex trafficking victims, where we know the average age in New York has been 11 to 14 years old. So that's where you're going to visit, www.shnintl.org, and you can call us there, but follow us, please, on, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, with that in mind, I think I would like to just go right into the questioning as it relates to sex trafficking, if I can, just to um, continue the conversation. And who will be there? Yes, yes. If you want, if you get to continue the conversation. Hold on, Jim. Hold on a second. Uh, Jim is from our, uh, our our vice division. Uh, we put vice back together. Uh, we had them uh, incorporated into the narcotics uh, division a, a number of years ago. But uh, I think it's such a specialization uh, after conversations with our chief detectives, Bob Boyce, we made the decision to, to reconstitute the vice division. But all along we've had a, uh, a major case human trafficking uh, team. And Jim's gonna talk about that. But it's not just, it's not just the one team. It's gotta be uh, all the NCOs, all the sector cops have to be aware of uh, what human traffic looks like, what, what, what the signs are, and, and how we can 
make those referrals over to Jim and, and to the NGOs and, and to the prosecutors to make sure that uh, we fully investigate each and every allegation, each and every complaint. So Jim. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Reverend Q. Um, first and foremost, good morning to everyone. Um, good morning. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Reverend Q invited me uh, last year when I first took over the Vice Division uh, to speak at a, a, a gathering of uh, a whole bunch of people from the Bronx. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for having me back to speak. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that today is uh, Awareness Day for Human Trafficking. Uh, it's a very, very important uh, issue that we're facing. Uh, our young people are facing every single day. Uh, compound that with social media, uh, and it's a treacherous world uh, perpetrated by treacherous people against innocent victims uh, who are very, very young. Um, when I look at uh, my case volume, uh, and, and like the commissioner says, and he actually used a great word, evolution, uh, evolution of law enforcement. Uh, we have to evolve. We have to address a, a subject matter that is as old as time, and, and that's prostitution mm -hmm. uh, and sex trafficking, uh, labor trafficking, uh, human slavery uh, is what it is. And uh, the, the people who are forced into this slavery are uh, affected greatly uh, to, to a point where um, nine months ago when I took over, I was aware but not immersed in the, in the topic of human trafficking. Uh, by, by meeting different people, including the Reverend Q uh, and others, the NGOs, speaking with the prosecutors around the city, involving myself with cases uh, that my detectives are working diligently uh, and the, the best part about my detectives is they're so empathetic, sympathetic to the victims and have a connection with the victims that we are able to prosecute and arrest uh, bad guys to a point where it's, my, my arrests are up 80%. My cases have doubled since 2014. Wow. Uh, my arrests are up 80%. And that's, that's a compliment uh, to my detectives who work extremely hard each and every day. We look at the victims and we, we speak with the NGOs, we speak with the prosecutors, and we decided uh, to talk about how we, the police department, can address victims of trafficking. Uh, we look at anyone under 18 years old as a victim. There is, you know, you, you could not maybe pinpoint a certain dynamic in their life that, of when it happened, but if you put the timeline out, and you look at a, a, a young woman's or a young person, a man's, uh, you know, lifeline, you can see at one point in time they intersect with something tra tragic in their life and it made them susceptible to becoming a victim of trafficking. So whenever we get involved with a, a young person who's been arrested for prostitution, we treat that person as a victim. We look to put that person in the hands of an NGO, a social service provider, so we can get medical attention. We get psychological counseling, job training, housing. We look to make sure that they're not victimized again by law enforcement. And we have the, uh, the partnership with the prosecutors around the city uh, to get that done. And we have. And it's, it's an honor for me to lead a, a group of, of people that we work together with, not only with my, uh, my partners in, in the prosecutor's office, but you, Reverend Q. Yeah. Uh, and, and the clergy-based uh, organizations around the city. Okay, more specifically, when you said 18 years and under as victims, as um, victims, so after 18, they, are they not? No, we, we vet every single arrest. Okay, that's what I mean. In other words, if, and thank you for bringing yes. that to my attention, uh, we vet every single arrest. If a person tells us they're a victim of sex trafficking, we take exceptional measures to make sure that they're removed from the system. And we do it in partnership with the prosecutors. Okay, the questions, and again, these questions came, a lot of these questions came from you, and so that's what we're gonna be spending our time on so you can walk away knowing that you've had your questions answered and some have come from me, uh, particularly regarding this. Um, how, how may we be, get a better handle on the number of traffic victims in our city? Um, can you speak to us about you know the, just the prevalence of the trafficking in New York City? Because in 2013, the last report we heard was it was 2,300. Children lost to sex trafficking, average age 11 to 14. And that has not, I mean, obviously it's not accurate, obviously it's more, how, how would you recommend on how do we uh, approach that? 
Well, statistics are a, a very funny thing, um, and most of the time, uh, sex trafficking is underreported. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, uh, people don't come forward to uh, express to us that they're victims of sex trafficking. It goes undocumented. It goes underreported. Uh, we have children who are uh, look. There's a connectivity between uh, domestic violence. There's a connectivity between uh, truancy. Uh, children having problems, uh, and we're looking to engage uh, as, uh, the community to get them on, on board with us to help us report victims of sex trafficking. And to that point, uh, we are uh, looking to uh, establish a, a sex trafficking hotline, uh, which we hopefully will have out um, very, very soon, so that anyone in the community uh, can take, uh, take the time and you know anonymously give us a call and say uh, I know somebody who's a victim of sex trafficking or even better I'm a victim of sex trafficking can you help me and we will take steps we'll, we'll take our uh, strides to make sure that we're, we engage and, and get that done okay and, then, and when I just want to again encourage the faith community you know to reach out to become safe havens right we offer the trains and everything let's do what we know we can do to help um, address the, uh, these issues. Those are, those are questions that we had regarding the, the trafficking end. Um, general questions, Commissioner. Um, what are the challenges, as you understand them, uh, to restoring, improving relations in communities of color? I think first and foremost is uh, full implementation of uh, neighborhood policing. And if you take a look at where we've gone with neighborhood policing, we started in uh, the 100, the 101, which is out in Far Rockaway, and the 33 and the 34, which is up in Manhattan. And then we moved to uh, the precincts, the, the busier precincts that where we do have the most challenges. We went to the 47, we went to the 44, we went to the 75, we went to the 79. And this is, this is how we're gonna restore trust, and it's, and it's all about trust. If we're gonna to continue to push that uh, crime down, and when you talk about statistics, you have to remember that each and every one of those numbers re uh, represents a human being. So it's our uh, obligation, as is, I think it's everybody's obligation in the city to, to push crime down. I think the way we're gonna do that is to make sure we have that connection between uh, the people actually out there doing the work. You know, prior to neighborhood policing, and this is certainly not a knock on anyone, um, they, the job of community relations was to two or three people. Uh, the precinct commander and the two or three community affairs officers within each and every precinct. And they do a great job and they continue to do a great job, but it's gotta be everybody involved. And I think that's how we're gonna make it better. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, hi. Joanne Jaffe, Chief of Community Affairs and also prior borough commander, Joe Waller Bronx. Um, you know, that's um, a very, very important mission of what we try to do in the Community Affairs Bureau, but obviously in the whole New York City Police Department, we've been working very, very closely with our immigrant communities, communities that feel more alienated and isolated for a variety of reasons, and of course, communities of color, as you asked uh, Reverend Q. Um, training has totally been revamped in the New York City Police Department. Um, probably don't have enough time to talk about that specifically, but just know that every officer is being tasked in the New York City Police Department um, with learning to build relationships, learning to reach out and interact with people in a, in a different way than when we came into the Police Department 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, it's stressed each and every day through training for recruits and through people that are going into, in training that is ongoing training for all of our offices. We work very closely with our clergy. I think everybody knows about the clergy liaison program. Every precinct, PSA, and transit district has certain clergy leaders from a variety of faiths and ethnicities and genders, and we work to incorporate and work closely with them. In addition, we have a youth advisory council. We have a citizens advisory council. Um, we have somebody here this morning from the Citizens Advisory Council that works closely with us and lets us know and gives us a feel for what's going on in the communities. 
We have lots of programs that deal with youth. Youth are a critical component to what we in the police department and we have, of people of faith and the citizens have to reach out and address the challenges and obstacles um, of just that growing up, what it entails and what it entails in the city and what it means to be a young person and be susceptible to gangs, crews, <coughs> drugs, um, staying in education, economic hardships and the like. And so that, those are all the things that we are doing. Um, not a full list, but just touching on some of the things. Can you tell us how does one get involved in the clergy liaison program, the Youth Advisory Council, um, and the Citizen Advisory Council? How do they get involved so, after today? So sure, the Citizen Advisory Council, when we first created it about uh, a year and a half ago, we said, how do we identify citizens out there that can work and kind of bring information to us. And we have something called the Citizens Police Academy. I know I have some graduates here. It is the best program the New York City Police Department has to offer. It's about 150 to 200 people twice a year. Go to the Police Academy once a week for 10 weeks. Every precinct commander, PSA commander, transit commander is tasked to identify those people through the community affairs offices and the NCO offices. So you go for 10 weeks, it's a commitment. We want our clergy to go, we want everyone to go. We want people that don't like the police to go. And it's a 10 week program. The valedictorian of every class for the past 10 years, so there's like 20 of them, mm -hmm. that was the foundation of our Citizens Advisory Council. They were elected to be that valedictorian of that class by the other citizens. So we said, what better than a leader? for that person. So we form that and we meet every couple of months. The, um, the a Youth Advisory Council, there's like 18 precincts and the boroughs are running Youth Advisory Councils. You can talk to your borough community affairs staff. Every borough commander has their own community affairs staff. So there are Youth Advisory Councils here in the Bronx. And those again are young people that are identifying with issues that they want to talk to the police about, and we are responsive to them. They meet about once a month. And then, well, the clergy liaison. We in the New York City Police Department have about 250 clergy liaisons. We ask clergy liaisons to, to go to the Citizens Police Academy so they could also learn specifically about police-related issues, and we could hear from them Every precinct commander, PSA commander, transit commander has the opportunity, they elect people that they want to be the clergy liaisons. We want a vast array of people, you know, all ethnicities are represented, and the precinct commander, PSA commander elect people to then become clergy liaisons. The borough commanders have meetings with their clergy liaisons, but more importantly, they are critical people in the communities to us the police department, our clergy liaisons, because we know they play a tremendous role in the communities that they serve, and they work with us to give us information and us to give information to get out to their congregations. Okay, thank you, and we do have a lot of questions, but um, I definitely want the chief of department, while you're piggybacking on that, the other question is, what is your role as the chief of department? Can you also answer that while you're piggybacking? No. There. Why well, uh, I'm the chief of the department, but not the chief of IT. Great to be back in uh, the Bronx, where in my eyes it's always uh, sunny and warm, like, like today uh -huh. in, in, in January. But <clears throat> as the chief of the department, I oversee uh, the seven operational uh, bureaus. Uh, Patrol Services Bureau, the Detective uh, Bureau, uh, Transportation, Housing, uh, Transit, uh, Community Affairs, and is that six? Six or seven? It's seven. I, I'm pretty sure I covered uh, I, I covered all seven. But I'm also the uh, highest ranking uniform uh, member of the service, and I'm, I'm very proud to have served here in the Bronx as the borough commander for uh, for four years. But certainly, uh, my, my best is I say that because of the, the caliber of uh, police officers in this borough, but more importantly, the caliber of, of the community members. It really 
it was always a, a team effort here in uh, in the Bronx. But I just wanted to add a few points to what the commissioner said and what Chief Jaffe said. Well, neighborhood policing, we said there's 35 uh, precincts in the city, there's small line uh, PSAs. Right here in the Bronx, nine out of the 12 precincts are under that model, the NCO model. And add to that the two PSAs, PSA 7 and, and PSA 8. And Eddie Lott here served uh, a year and a half as the commanding officer of PSA 8. And Joanne touched on the, uh, the training. The, all the training is about being policing justly, policing fairly. Uh, a field training unit, a field training has been uh, revamped as, uh, as you were well aware and in the past when officers graduated from the police academy, they were put into impact zones and you had one up here on, uh, on, on White Plains Road. Mm -hmm. Now they, now they uh, work with a, a senior officer and there's a, there's a high supervisory uh, ratio. It used to be one sergeant to maybe 12 or 15 officers. Now, one training sergeant oversees just two officers, and you're part of this training also, the community partners, and I know many of you here in the room you know, serve as that, so it's all about building trust from the top all the way to the bottom in, in everything that we do in the, in the police department. Who here knows about the NCOs in your neighborhood? Okay, put your hands down. Who here does not know? Okay. And so the way you get connected is by getting connected to your local precinct. Mm -hmm. And once you get connected to your local precinct, then you'll, they'll be able to let you know who your NCO is. And again, it's not throughout the entire city, but we also can find out where those 35 are through the website. Just go through your community council is the best way to get connected, through your community council. I'm going to go on to the next questions. We do have a lot. How, how may, and I'm, just, I'm going to combine the questions of Commissioner, how may local churches, CBOs, and city agencies increase coordination to address community issues? And then what could we do, what could we be doing differently to collaborate and build trust within the communities that we serve? I'm going to jump in right off with the NCL stuff, especially for, uh, is this on? You hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't know if you need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told I'm a little loud. I have that Bronx accent that uh, people know for a long time. All right. With the NCOs, how, how do we get to know them? The people that raised their hands and said that they knew their NCOs, we want you to interact with them. We want you to bring them to your churches. Have them speak at your churches. Get them to know your congregation. You're all here today. And you probably come to meetings all the time. The goal for our NCOs is to go out into your community, to go and meet the people that don't come out to meetings, to get to meet the people in your church, at their locations, at their buildings. That would be the message I would give to every one of you, every one of the faith providers here. Invite your NCOs. And also, we talked about the steady sectors, the cops that are riding in the radio cars in their free time. Invite them, get to know who they are, and bring them into your churches. Introduce them to your congregations and work together. Every community has a problem, localized. We talk about a lot of stuff that Joanne does on a citywide level among leaders. The NCO is to take this exact program down that she does at the upper level down to the grassroots. To the cop that you're going to see dressed in a uniform every single day, walking past your church, walking past your house of worship and bring them in and work together to resolve the issues out there. It's been long said that we used to uh, police at the communities instead of with the communities. The whole goal of this is we're a team. If you're on your block, there's businesses, there's churches, there's residents. Let's get them all together in one room with our cops and discuss what the issues are and how we can resolve those issues. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to add one thing, and what Mary uh, said reminded that I think the last time we had this meeting, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, and something was said that uh, sticks with me every day. It's, uh, we were getting some questions from the audience, and somebody stood up and said that we feel that policing is something that is done to us and not with us, and that's, that's what we're looking to change. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, if I could go back to the question, it's... Um, how can we increase coordination to address community issues and what can we do differently to collaborate and build trust within the communities that we serve? So when we 
I'm not the head of IT either. Um, so when we, when we took a look at this neighborhood policing model, we knew that it was just not a, a magic transformation. We knew that it would require a tremendous amount of uh, training for our NCOs and for our sector police officers. So we put our NCOs through a, a multi-week course. Uh, the first one they went through was criminal investigation, and then we put them through a, a program that we designed, the training program for it specifically for NCOs. A lot of that has to do with uh, uh, how to conduct a meeting, mediation training. Uh, so it is, it is a skill that uh, is uh, that you have to work at. It's not something that, that, that you get by magic. And I think that uh, a lot of the cops that we have, a lot of the police officers we have now, not only police officers, sergeants, lieutenants, and, and some captains, and I think even some deputy inspectors came up through IMPACT. And IMPACT is, uh, is a program that it did help us bring crime down, but it did, uh, I think it did, hinder us a bit in, in uh, uh, developing uh, relationships with the community, and also hindering our ability to develop leaders. Uh, you know, it's the, now with the FTO program, I think we've, we've, uh, we're moving in the right direction, but it's, a, it's a definitely a two-way street. It's, uh, it's gotta be the police officers reaching out, but it's also, when they do, uh, they have to, uh, uh, the people in the community uh, need to make an effort too, so we have to meet somewhere in the middle. Okay. I'd just like to add, you know, for, for the religious leaders that are sitting here, obviously, you know, it's going to be hard if you're telling your congregation of 400 people, you know, go say hello to a cop and that's how you're going to start the conversation. That would be ideal. But every precinct in PSA has community council meetings. They've existed for years. They're an elected board, elected by citizens, not by the New York City Police Department. And we work with them, but they are the leaders of the community councils. In every precinct in the city, in PSA in the city, they meet once a month, whether it's the third Monday or the second Tuesday. It's consistent, and it's consistent where it is. And that's the number one way to start that relationship if you want to get involved. You could always say hi to, cop, uh, hi to an officer and develop that relationship. But to get involved in what's going on in the community, to have a voice, to let the police hear you, the community, that's how we're going to hear you. That's the number one forum. Now, we run a lot of programs. We do a lot in schools. We build community relations through those events. But how are you going to find out about them if you don't get involved in your community councils? Get to know us as people, and we can hear from you because we want to get to know you. Okay, thank you. Are there different policing protocols per, uh, per community in New York City? And we can elaborate on that. I would say there's, <laughs> there's different uh, protocols. There are different issues and different challenges across the city in different precincts. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why, again, uh, harkening back to the NCO program, uh, the NCOs were able to, to make that distinction and figure out, not just by themselves, and again, this isn't something we do by ourselves, it's, you know, uh, identifying problems, that ha that has to be something that's done jointly and, and solutions to those problems. So, uh, this we do have, uh, you know, there's uh, rules and regulations, patrol guides, there's consistent uh, things that uh, police officers do. But again, uh, the way we handle uh, problems, a huge part of neighborhood policing is, is pushing that decision making down to the police officer level. For a long time, we were a very top-down organization. I think if you're gonna build leadership and if you're gonna have that connection to the community, you have to let police officers uh, use their discretion and they do have a tremendous amount of discretion to make sure you build that relationship. I think that they were, they were doubling up on that question because some were feeling that part of that has to do with the difference between the protocols in, in, in communities of color versus not. So that's basically what they were asking about. Yeah, uh, understood, Reverend Q. It's we we are primarily a uh, 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 an organization that keeps people safe. This is this is we are a crime fighting organization, and that, that's really why people become police officers because they have this uh, need to keep people safe. So wherever we go throughout the city, uh, wherever there's violence and crime. That's where we have to, to, to use our resources, but it has to be used wisely, it has to be used fairly, and as Carlos said, it has to be used legitimately. So that's why you've seen a tremendous reduction in uh, stop question and frisk. That's why you've seen a reduction in arrest. That's why you've seen a reduction in the criminal court summons and stuff. It has to be done fairly. 
Um, the next question was, how can they start a program that will reach out to their community about um, law enforcement working with us for a safe place to live and to work in? Um, basically, how did they create that collaboration? I think they already answered that question. And that's basically going to your local precinct and actually engaging um, on that level. Um, but what I'm going to do right now, we're going, we're hearing a lot about how do we build relationship? How do we work together? Knowing that we're not, no, no entity is doing everything right, right? They're, they're admitting they don't do everything, we don't do everything right as faith leaders, community don't do everything right as community, right? So what we're trying to say here is that public safety is a shared responsibility. And so what can we do by looking through these issues that we're all facing and looking at it through one another lenses so that we can come to some type of common goal of restoring peace um, in our uh, community. So there's some things that have been happening across the city. People have been doing amazing work in, in, in their backyard to intentionally build um, community. So right now I'm gonna show you a, a, a video. Uh, and then right after the video, we're gonna hear from uh, our local uh, um, inspector, Ruel Stevenson, just to share some of the things that they've done that have been innovative in helping to build trust, which is important. Right? This is all about how do we restore that trust in community 